Hi and welcome to Quick Guys for Medicine. My name is Fatai, I'm a hospitalist and assistant professor here in South Carolina. Today we'll be talking about pneumonia. Pneumonia, obviously, one of the more common infectious uh, uh, diseases that we would normally encounter in general internal medicine, ICU, uh, uh, and hospitalist practice in general. Uh, so we'll talk about all of the different diagnostic terminologies and how that translates into the specific treatment uh, protocol treatment uh, uh, options. In this case, we're going to try to focus on antibiotics because the general treatment, you know, respiratory support, we already discussed in other videos. Uh, in this video, like I said, we'll focus on the antibiotic, uh, 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 specific antibiotic uh, regimens uh, for pneumonia based on these categories. So starting, first of all, you, you basically want to say whether there is pneumonia or not. So you say patient has pneumonia. Why do you say patient has pneumonia? They more likely have pulmonary infiltrates, all right? Whether you're looking at that on a, a X-ray or in a CT scan, sometimes X-rays, some of the earlier pneumonia may not be uh, uh, visible in an X-ray. Uh, you might have to get a CT scan. So that would be the logical progression in, in imaging choice. Um, but why did you even get that image in the first place? Maybe they had a cough, all right? They had a fever. All right, they had elevated WBCs. These are all of the, for example, here would be indications for uh, uh, or th pointers towards an infectious process. The cough is a pointer towards a pulmonary infectious process, and obviously the pulmonary infiltrates will be the 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 almost like a dis decided definitive uh, um, feature uh, for a pneumonia. So yeah, they have a pneumonia. We made that diagnosis, but how do we treat? There's a endless list of antibiotics that you could use, but how are you making those decisions that are specifically covering the agents that you want to, to treat? This is the first thing I'll say in this particular scenario <clears throat> and in all other infectious disease uh, scenarios. Empiric antibiotic decisions or empiric antibiotic choice should be focused on the most common isolated organisms in this particular you know, diagnostic terminology. So here we have several diagnostic terminologies. CAP here for community, right, acquired pneumonia, all right? Community acquired pneumonia. We have here hospital acquired and ventilator associated pneumonia. All right, you probably would be wondering that you've heard, you know, healthcare associated pneumonia for a while. You know, why why am I not using that? Recently, perhaps in the 2016 slash 2019 ATS and uh, Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, they tend to want to move away from healthcare associated pneumonia as a terminology and want to focus on non-ventilator, you see that I put envy here, non-ventilator non -ventilator hospital, hospital acquired pneumonia or ventilator associated pneumonia. The reason why, the reason for this is for a while, especially when you use the terminology of healthcare associated pneumonia, which is, for example, patients coming from, uh, who's been hospitalized within the last 90 days, patients come from nursing home, patients in a dialysis, uh, currently requiring dialysis, uh, uh, patient you know, requiring complex wound care. What, had ha what has happened over the years is that you tend to find people using a lot more, you know, uh, uh, the bigger antibiotics for these diagnoses, you know, based on the healthcare associated pneumonia category, you tend to have a lot more risk for antibiotic resistance and unnecessary use of some of these broad spectrum antibiotics. So. The reason why we're kind of going back now to the hospital associated pneumonia as a terminology is that you can then decide specifically based on certain criteria what types of pneumonia will have an increased risk for specific organisms that you want to treat accordingly. Like I said, we're moving away from the healthcare associated pneumonia as a terminology we're moving towards specifically hospital acquired pneumonia and uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. We'll talk about some of the risk factors in just a little bit. Aspiration pneumonia is also uh, a diagnostic terminology that would tend to have a specific antibiotic 
uh, uh, pros, uh, antibiotic uh, uh, regimen to it. Uh, viral pneumonia, for the most part, we're not using antibiotics in this case. It, it, it's pretty much, you know, a lot of time supportive treatment and respiratory, respiratory support. Fungal pneumonia, uh, for some of the patients that tend to grow some of these cultures, uh, or patients who are severely immunocompromised, uh, uh, whether you're dealing with uh, 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 HIV AIDS in patients with risk of uh, um, uh, PCP pneumonia, patients with risk of some of the serious fungal pneumonia. But for the fungal part, it's usually immunocompromised patient. That's when you want to start thinking about that for the most part. But again, it will be based on the, your cultures, you know, uh, that would tend to point you in that direction. Now, going back to community acquired pneumonia, how do we treat community acquired pneumonia? Remember, I said with infectious disease process in general, you're always asking the first question what are the most commonly isolated organisms in this uh, particular disease? For community acquired pneumonia, we're talking about strep pneumo, strep, oh boy, strep pneumo, strep pneumonia, and then we're talking about the atypicals, right? strep pneumonia and atypicals. And again, we're saying this patient hasn't really had any recent hospital contact. You know, they're coming from the community. They, 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 they have decreased risk of multi-drug resistant organisms or some of the some more serious organisms. These are the organisms we're focused on in community acquired pneumonia. pneumonia. Now, there's two ways to look at uh, antibiotic regimen for uh, community acquired pneumonia. You can do a dual therapy all right, or you could do a monotherapy, all right? The dual therapy will be two medications, obviously, one covering strep pneumonia, and in this case, we tend to focus on, now I'm talking about hospitalized patients, by the way. For uh, uh, patients who are on the outside, you, you probably could use some of the basic, you know, anti antibiotics that would normally cover strep pneumonia as well, and uh, atypical both. If the patient is hospitalized, this is the treatment regimen. Strep pneumonia, Coverage here will be ceftriaxone. And again, we're talking about empiric therapy. These are the things that you do before you actually have any culture results. Ceftriaxone for strep pneumo. And for the atypicals, we have an option between azithromycin or doxycycline. All right? Why would I choose doxycycline, for example, over azithromycin? Remember, azithromycin has a risk of causing QT prolongation, so if they have, actually have QT prolongation, doxycycline will be my option. If we switch now to the monotherapy, you want something that covers strep pneumo and also covers atypical at the same time, and your choice here will be the fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones. I always use, like a trick question to my students, will be all fluoroquinolones cover strep pneumo except which one? And for you, the answer is ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin does not cover strep pneumo. So if you're thinking about strep pneumo coverage with the fluoroquinolones, it will be levofloxacin, all right? Levofloxacin, moxifloxacin. At least the ones that we tend to use routinely. Levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, levofloxacin, uh, uh, levoquin, levofloxacin is perhaps the one that most people would use. So again, dual therapy, ceftriaxone, for the strep pneumo, azithro, or doxycycline for the atypicals, and if you have to use one medication, we're going to be talking about levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. Now, coming here to hospital acquired pneumonia or ventilator associated pneumonia, the more important thing you're looking at here is what is the risk that this patient perhaps has an exposure to two very serious organisms? And these are the same organisms you want to be worried about in septic shock in general, Pseudomonas or MRSA. And currently the guideline will be to look at patients, for example, where do I put this? I'm going to put it here, All right? Patients who've had IV antibiotics within, the 90, within 90 days, All right. those are the patients at risk, by the way, uh, patients who have septic shock at the time of the pneumonia, obviously it's telling you there's some serious organisms that's really running them down. Patients who have ARDS, you know, prior to the pneumonia. Uh, patients who uh, 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 they've had about five days of hospitalization prior to the pneumonia. It tells you that wherever they got, wherever pneumonia they got was within the hospital and patients currently requiring 
uh, uh, renal replacement therapy, and again, in a hospitalized patient, in a hospitalized sit setting. These are the things that tell you that now you have to be worried about pseudomonas and MRSC. All right, so if you're choosing empiric antibiotics here, it will be medications that will cover pseudomonas and medications that will cover MRSA. So um, what are the ones that cover pseudomonas? Our you know, routine choice will be piperacillin, tazobactam, zosin for short, for the brand name, if that's what you remember, or cefepime, all right, for the pseudomonas coverage. You could throw in the carbapanems here, but the carbapanems routinely are reserved for some of the more uh, drug resistant scenarios, you know, patients with extended spectrum uh, organisms and uh, multi drug resistant organisms. So you could throw it in there. I could throw it in there. All right, but again, the, routinely you probably want to start with either of these, Piptazo or Cefepim. For the MRSC, vancomycin is your guy. Vancomycin is your guy. And again, this is for patients who have some nosocomial uh, uh, exposure based on these. We're no longer using healthcare associated pneumonia, like I said, based on these risk factors. IV antibiotics with 90 days septic shock, ARDS, five days prior to the pneumonia, patient currently requiring renal replacement therapy. The very quick thing, you know, before, before for a while, I used to think that cefepime and peptase would probably have the same you know, coverage, but then later on, I realized, obviously everybody learns every day, that the Piptazo has better anaerobic coverage than Cefepime. So if you're ever thinking of anaerobic coverage in any situation, your Piptazo is a better choice. Cefepime doesn't have as much anaerobic coverage, so you might have to add some anaerobic coverage. Meropenem has excellent anaerobic coverage again. So the only downside for Cefepime is that it does not have quite enough anaerobic coverage. Um, the reason why I'm talking about that is now we're going to aspiration pneumonia. For aspiration pneumonia, routinely people would say, oh, for every aspiration pneumonia, you have to add anaerobic coverage. But if you look at some of the uh, recent IDSA and ATS guidelines, they, they're tending to want to stay away from that if there is no clear imaging uh, finding of, uh, of uh, 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 anaerobic infection, which will be empyema or long abscess, all right? Empyema or long abscess. If you see that in pneumonia, boom, you have to add anaerobic coverage. But if you don't have that, you could still add it, right? You could still add it, uh, 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 but again, that would be case-based scenarios. Um, what are the things in general that suggest anaerobic uh, um, pneumonia or aspiration pneumonia? Let's do it that way. What are the things that suggest aspiration pneumonia? Patient with altered mental status, all right? patient with dysphagia, all right? So basically, patients at risk of aspiration, and if you have imaging finding to suggest that it is aspiration, maybe right lower lobe pneumonia might point you towards aspiration pneumonia. So how do you treat it? The important thing is still to cover, to treat it like community-acquired pneumonia, right? If they fit that picture, or to treat it like hospital-acquired pneumonia, if they fit that picture. So if you're thinking community-acquired pneumonia, strep pneumonia will still be your guy. And for the most part, this is perhaps maybe the most important thing you have to do. Ceftriaxone here, all right? Strep pneumo will still be your guy. Ceftriaxone will be the drug of choice there. Uh, and then you can add your anaerobic coverage. Anaerobic coverage here, metronidazole, would tend to be our routine metronidas or would tend to be our drug of choice in that regard, all right? You could get away with just doing ceftriaxone. Like I said, if there's no lung abscess, if there's no empyema, you could get away with doing that. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, I don't think it hurts adding metronidazole. If you're thinking aspiration pneumonia, altered mental status, dysphagia, right, lower lobe pneumonia, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. You can do it. It shouldn't be a problem. If you're thinking now that this patient perhaps has some nosocomial exposure based on these, right, based on these, instead of ceftriaxone here, it will be one of these guys, Piptazo, right, or meropenem. Remember I told you 
that if you have to use cefepim, again, if you have to use piptazo by itself, it, it does strep pneumo coverage, it does, uh, uh, sorry, it does, in the case of hospital acquired ammonia, it does pseudomonas coverage, but it also has excellent anaerobic coverage. So by itself, one antibiotic, you're done. But if you're going down the route of cefepim, you would have to use cefepim, and you'd have to provide some anaerobic recovery because like I said, cefepim doesn't have sufficient anaerobic coverage. <clears throat> Moving forward, you would then go to viral pneumonia. Like I said, this is more supportive treatment. All right, supportive treatment. If in case of COVID, obviously we had to use steroids, um, but that's really about it. Except you're sure that there is evidence of superimposed anti, uh, superimposed bacterial pneumonia on top of the viral pneumonia, which is not unusual. Then you would add the appropriate antibiotic based on. The category you're looking at, if you're looking at community acquired pneumonia, yes. If you're looking at uh, hospital acquired pneumonia, uh, 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 that also applies. For fungal pneumonia, it will be immunocompromised patients, like we mentioned, compromise, and that's typically, you know, PCP pneumonia. Uh, if we're thinking that, obviously, HIV patients with uh, uh, a very, very low CD4 count, um, you're thinking Bactrim will be a bit more specific in that regard and then you add in steroids, indication for steroids will be uh, AA gradient of uh, 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 more than 35 or arterial oxygen PaO2 of less than 70, AA gradient more than 35, PaO2 of less than 70. That would be the indication for steroids in PCP pneumonia. If you're thinking other types of pneumonia, it will be mostly culture, culture guided. If it's other type of fungal infections, for example, in, in patients with very severe immunocompromising, you're thinking empiric uh, antifungal coverage, the echinocandins tend to be a good you know, choice because they have a little bit more extended spectrum. Um, so I'm going to put it there, caspofungin and the rest of them. All right, a kind of candens. All right, so that's pneumonia in a, in a, in a, at a glance, um, specifically going based on the, the different diagnostic categories and how we would normally address the empiric antibiotic choices in the regimen. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.